So I'm going to, to start out the conversation, I'm going to ask uh, Marcia to, to do a bit of sketching of the, the landscape. So as a layperson uh, looking at the defense marketplace in this country, you could kind of segregate firms that compete on projects or that are potentially interested in projects into a bunch of different uh, buckets. Uh, the people that win, um, people that compete and lose, people that lose because it wasn't a competition, um, firms that qualify uh, as part of an ITQ uh, process that respond to RFIs, uh, but they don't actually submit a bid. Um, and then there's, I think, probably some other categories that are emerging as we're moving to some of these procurement processes where we select a winner and then a potential alternate. Um, I don't really know how you classify the error and the spare scenario, but I guess, uh, Marcia, if you could start off, talk a little bit about how all those firms have standing uh, in these procurements, uh, how they can relate to the, the government of, of Canada and what avenues are open to them uh, if they aren't as successful as they would like to be uh, and would like to do something about it. The way to consider these different groups are when you're talking about the concept of who has standing, you're talking about somebody who wants to lodge a complaint at a later point in time. So if we want to put the the group, the companies into buckets, as you kind of suggested, there are those who win the competition. They're obviously not going to complain about winning and their communication methodology with the government after they win is as a contractor. So they're into the mix, they're executing on the project and they're carrying on as we all anticipate we would do. Those that compete and lose, and when I say compete and lose means they go through to the final stages of the procurement, whether it's starting with the RFI, getting qualified, going through the procurement and losing in the final um, final end evaluation, they also have what's known as standing with the government to discuss the issues of the procurement during the procurement process following the conclusion of the procurement if they're a loser, if they've lost, I'm sorry, I wouldn't call them a loser, I just said they weren't successful at that point, um, they will have standing to deal with that issue either directly with the government, which is where your first line of dispute would start. If the procurement was covered by the trade agreements, then they would also have standing or the ability to bring a complaint at the CITT. They also have the ability to seek a judicial review or to seek some other litigation mechanism if they're not happy with the outcome. If they're under a procurement that isn't subject to the trade agreements, then again, their first line of contact for dispute is with the government. And then they can move into the litigation scenario, either a judicial review of the decision, which is an administrative decision review, or if they want, they can move forward to, to seek litigation. If you're a party who's participated only partway through the procurement, and um, perhaps you've either been eliminated at the RFI process, or you qualified and then you decided to withdraw your bid, you've decided it's not feasible for you to go on. At that point, your quote, standing capacity changes a little bit. If you wanna bring a dispute at the trade tribunal, you once you've withdrawn from the procurement, you're no longer a potential supplier. So the CITT or the Canadian International Trade Tribunals likely not going to hear a complaint unless you're bringing a specific complaint about the way in which the procurement was managed and you're doing it within the particular timeframes. And I won't get into that level of complexity for today, of course. Um, otherwise, if you decide to withdraw because you feel the procurement is unfair or, or um, it's being uh, how you know geared towards one company, for example, if you withdraw, then you still have the potential to either seek a judicial review or to bring a litigation action. But you, but you will need to, of course, be cognizant of the timing associated with that. So that that's kind of if you wanna talk about the groups and when you can converse with the government. The other point I'll mention is the interaction with the government is also um, bears with it an element of lobbying. So depending on if you're participating in the process or you're not participating in the process, how you interact with the government will also be colored by whether you are lobbying on behalf of yourself for say a policy change or a change in direction for the procurement or whether you're participating as a bidder and you're following the communication processes that all of um, the, commu the 
procurement processes have attached to them, which is as for those of us who participated in bids, you know, during a procurement, you're only supposed to be communicating, for example, with the contracting authority, it's all supposed to be done in writing. Those questions and communications that you send in for the most part will be shared with all the other bidders, including the government's response. Um, but otherwise, once you're moving outside of the procurement process and you're not participating as a bidder, then you do have to consider whether what you're doing is actually lobbying, whether on your, your own behalf as an employee of the company or whether um, if you're part of a lobbying group or a, or a consultant lobbyist firm and you're working on behalf of another company, then you have to also consider the aspects of lobbying and compliance with those requirements. Dan, to, to come to you, you were ADM Matt uh, for one of the longer tenures that, that folks have hold, held that job. Um, you were also in the job at a time when Canada went through effectively kind of a step change in the amount of procurement, big procurements that were going ahead. So while you were in the, the job, uh, a whole lot of people won um, through various tech, uh, mechanisms, some of them uh, competitions, some of them sole source contracts, others contracts that kind of felt in between using advanced contract award notice processes and other things that sort of felt between sole sourcing and, and full competition, uh, which also meant that there were a lot of uh, far more people interested in those pursuits at the time that you were there that were not unsuccessful than probably most of your predecessors going back a few decades um, had experienced. Uh, what's your experience of how those different companies uh, reacted and, and what did that do to your uh, side of the equation on the government uh, end of things in, in terms of the wider procurement landscape and how you were able to go about doing your job? In general, I think that companies um, reacted fairly well. I mean, Canada is not hugely litigious. I recall uh, three losers, three losing firms, not losers, obviously. Um, the CF-18 targeting pods was a big contract and a company lost and took us to CITT. Uh, and that, that, that resulted in a long conversation. The submarine maintenance contract to Babcock was contested, went all the way to the Supreme Court and the uh, litigation failed. And of course, maritime helicopter project, which uh, was already under litigation before I took over ADM at. Um, the, the landscape was somewhat uh, constrained because there was a lot of pressure from, from PSPC and industry to use uh, national security exceptions. Because national security exceptions set aside trade agreements and CITT, which raised the bar so if you wanted to legally contest something, you had to go to federal court uh, and most companies didn't. Um, so I guess my, my, my experience was the interaction with, with companies who were pursuing something, they, they understood the important phase was prior to, con to RFP draft release where they needed to, if they were going to lobby, they were getting, they were lobbying exempt staff, political exempt staff, or they're working hard on requirement staff. They're working work hard on requirement staff to shape the shape the need, shape the SOR to their advantage. And that's the most critical phase of, of, a, of any major procurement. And you know, the Lockheed Martins and the BAEs and the, and the Boeings, they really, really understand that stuff. Once you lost, they lost. There wasn't a lot of um, subsequent activity. If you're, for example, a lean and you lose fixed wing search and rescue, you're probably not coming back to do any more business in Canada because that was your business. That opportunity has been competed. A result has been achieved and people have moved on. So my, my experience with, with companies was almost entirely in the pre-definition phase. Pre-definition pre and into definition. In definition, you're you're, you're, you're actually running a procurement. So Charlie, from your time in industry, just to kind of take off directly on something that, that Dan just touched there, um, different companies have, have a different kind of mix of interests. Um, there's different corporate cultures. There's uh, some firms that are interested in one particular project in pursuit. Um, there will be others that have a, a wider kind of series of opportunities that, that they're looking at. Um, as well as uh, the differences between firms that are just playing in the Canadian marketplace, as well as, as having their eyes on, on other uh, opportunities uh, in other jurisdictions. So I guess, give some reflection on, on the view from industry. Um, everyone obviously wants to win, uh, but some different perspectives on how people react uh, when they aren't successful. Well, usually the, 
the, the decision of a win or a loss or the selection of the winning uh, team is, is the end of a very long process. It's been painful. Uh, it's gone through uh, more than one government most of the time, uh, in fact, two or three or four. Uh, and in fact, uh, another one of the problem is that uh, it takes such a long time to go from what Dan produces as to what he needed in defense to what the corporation wants to deliver, technology is going faster. Uh, so you're forever trying to catch up with that and, and, and trying to, to come to grip with that. So, so it's the first part. But there'd be no doubt that, especially the major contract, uh, uh, ship replacement, uh, land vehicle replacement, aircraft, you name it, these are major contracts. Uh, but the, but uh, the majority or a great deal of the larger company, the Boeing of this world and others, uh, that's not their only thing, uh, you know, either a type of airplane or what. So they're quite diversified, and, uh, and that's the first part. The second part also is Canada from a, uh, I'm talking about the large OEM here, BAE and General Dynamics and Lockheed and, and Boeing and others. Canada is not a big market. I mean, uh, in order, uh, 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 it's not that big uh, in the bigger picture, in the massive picture. It is a chunk, obviously. Uh, and it's an important part, though, because a lot of the company are concerned that if you lose here, it may impact on how another country will look at you and say, hey, the Canadian selected such. Likewise, a company may use a win elsewhere to, to, to uh, lobby or to show the Canadian government that they are able to put a solid package together and, and bring it all at the same time. Uh, the uh, the, cor the corporations differ into litigation and it's in their DNA. Some company will say, we don't, we're not in the business of suing our customers. Others will easily uh, go to court uh, if they feel they have to. Uh, and then you have to look back at this and say, why are they doing this? Is this because that's the end of the line? If they don't get this contract, it's going to be serious damage or that's, that's the only deal in town. Whereas the others may say, well, we really don't want to go to court because we're trying to bid on space program and on, on, on other land program and other program. So you've got to balance all of this. Although the, the, the selection uh, uh, in, in the Canadian government will say, uh, uh, there's no, you know, we don't mix all of them. Uh, you're worried about it. And, uh, and uh, I think if we look at the fighter replacement program, go back a couple of years, uh, and how the Canadian government reacted to one of the company's posture uh, and said, we will not, you know, we, we, we won't buy from a company that's suing us, for example. So the litigation is, is an interesting point uh, from an OEM perspective. And again, it will depend a lot on what this, this company, uh, to go through, it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, work uh, with the, the point. So that corporate culture, though, is an aggressive one, and it's a team effort. And now I'm talking about the OEM, but I'll cross over to the SMEs uh, uh, in a small and medium enterprise because they're facing sometime a different problem. Uh, the market in Canada, in most of the places, is not large enough to keep a small company going with a single uh, uh, a single point. So they will usually, uh, and they'll find themselves uh, working for more than one of the OEM. And therefore, they may get under the pressure from one of the OEM to keep quiet or to be incentivized by saying, well, if we win, you'll get more. And, and, and again, it, it ties itself to all, all of this point. But I think we have to be realistic as well is the, uh, the, the industrial technical benefit, the ITVs uh, that come with the offer uh, or the bid, if the company doesn't win, other countries in the world want ITVs as well. So it's not a question of taking your toys and going home. It's a question of these ITVs will have to go elsewhere for another bid that may be successful because each country wants something out of this, what's in it for them. So absolutely, uh, it, it's a, uh, it's something they'll be working at. Uh, some uh, difficulties also is we've I've seen personally, but also I've heard of. So none of this is really necessarily restricted to my past 
corporation that I work for, but rather uh, all of the industry that I've watched. Uh, and uh, it's such a small company, but their survival is so dependent on it that they'll bid with, they'll be part of two different bids, which is difficult for an OEM then to say, okay, you're going to be part of my team, but what are you creating as a firewall so that information does it cross one way or the other? And how do we keep that? that in mind. So it's a, it's a difficult part. Losing for a small company, maybe the uh, maybe either the end of it uh, or uh, moving on. I'll just close uh, without taking too much time, uh, uh, David, uh, with just also, you know, you've got the capabilities, you've got the costs, you've got the ITBs, um, uh, all of this is, is packaged together in the bid, is we, we have to start being more cognizant of prearranged commitments that may have been made in the past for certain work to be done or uh, and whatever. And it gets very frustrating for the larger company when you see a baseline changing, changing with the political winds uh, uh, that goes through that. So uh, it happens, it's recognized. I mean, uh, you understand part of it, but industry likes stability and predictability. And if you do not have these two, it's difficult. I remember talking to a, a European country where the government will decide whether the capability will be purchased or not, and the funding will be provided. Then the, the political part will withdraw itself and let the process take place, whether it's a department, the various departments together, to deliver whatever the best product is for their military. Uh, that's an ideal model to me, is, uh, but it's not the model that we're seeing in Canada. I'll stop there. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Dan, to, to come back to you, one of the other things that, that happened when you were ADM, Matt, um, was a, a, an evolution in the approach to in-service support for major fleets. So went uh, through a shift towards having a bundling of contracts. And you mentioned Maritime Helicopter, which is one of the kind of the first big ones to go in that direction, at least on the, the air side, to having the in-service support of a platform tied to its acquisition. Um, generally for potentially long periods of time, um, although often sort of structured as an initial contract award with the potential for multiple um, option years uh, later on over time. Uh, as we sit here about a decade later, um, almost all of the fleets um, that went ahead under that model and when you were still working in government, um, at, to at least as far as I can tell, are tied to support being provided by the original OEM, um, but at the same time, national defense and the government's moved away from that bundling model and, and opened up that work to an individual business case uh, analysis. So the landscape around the long-term provision of support um, has changed. There was a period about a decade ago where a lot of it was tied and you had an incumbent situation being cr created over time, which uh, doesn't seem to have really been, um, have many of them have been unseated as time has, has gone on. Um, some reflection from you about how the in-service support, uh, which uh, in some cases is more consequential in terms of the dollars attached to it, um, but also given the nature of the Canadian marketplace, there's more Canadian firm involvement. How, how has incumbency unfolded in that space um, as you've observed it? A couple of really important parameters to that conversation. The first one is an intellectual property and background IP. Where firms like Lockheed Martin or BAE or Talus or whoever uh, expend enormous amounts of energy and effort in developing technology. And they want, and although the government of Canada may have um, aspirations of somehow buying and owning and modifying that into future IP, that's a bit of a bit of a stretch. Um, and the, the second part of that, that point is most of the revenue the retained revenue, trained earnings going forward by these big companies is in ISS, in service support. It's not an initial acquisition. I mean, I've had many CEOs or VPs say, we're not gonna make much money here on the acquisition, but we'll recoup that investment in in service support over the next five years, 10 years, 20 years. And so that that is an enormous, that shapes their behavior, of course. Now to talk about in-service support, ISSCF, in-service support con con conceptual framework, which we developed in 2009. We did that not because of um, this notion that we needed to own IP or be able to hand that out to Canadian companies. We did that because it was the only, that, that moment of the initial procurement 
and bum bundling initial procurement with interest support was the only opportunity, the only day in which you could leverage the quality and reliability of your product. Less so in aircraft, but hugely so, so in land equipment and Navy programs. Quality and reliability, which, which if you linked the comp to two-part competition, if you had competition, you could drive that you could drive up your quality and your reliability and drive down your maintenance costs, drive down your maintenance uh, effort, drive down, um, drive up your operational availability. So there's huge upsides to that. But these were hard conversations. They were really, really hard conversations. I think MHP tried to go there, but I think Sikorsky made some strategically bad decisions in what they signed up for in terms of in-service support a single base of payment on flying hours. I think D&D is much more sophisticated than that. And the ISSCF conceptual framework recognized that it was a set of principles that we applied case by case. Um, to, but to get to your question more specifically, I think the government of Canada would like to move more ISS business to Canadian firms, but that's aspirational because it's really, really hard to do. It's really, really hard to do in terms of intellectual property and the complexities of that technical data and IP. Um, and the second part is if you, if you could buy it and you probably can buy it, do you have anyone that can actually use it? Can you actually give it to a Canadian firm who actually probably isn't in that deep technology business to take it over and run, for example, the maintenance of a, of a fighter or the combat system of a frigate? Although I, I think we've just seen Lockheed Martin lose that CMS 332 G, GDMS, which is an interesting uh, development. But, but basically, it's really, really hard to make a change from that paradigm that you talked about, Dave. So Charlie, when, when people in industry uh, are looking at a potential pursuit um, and either in the position of being the incumbent themselves uh, or looking to unseat one, when you're going through the, in your analysis, you're looking at your probability of winning, what kind of advantage do you automatically assume that incumbent companies hold uh, as, you're, as you're looking at that? Are they always assumed that they hold the upper hand? Are there certain circumstances in which um, there's actually a chance where an incumbent may be disadvantaged um, in a scenario like one where you'd have to go through a fleet transition as, as an example? Um, and, and when you are an incumbent, uh, how motivated are you by a concern of losing, not just the business, but some of the other reputational um, aspects that you touched on? Yes, uh, considering, especially Canada, we tend to keep our equipment for quite a while, you know, 40, 50 years. Uh, you know, if you go into the 50, 40, 50 year time frame, 80% of the total cost of a program will be on in-service support uh, and, and much of that, whereas the acquisition itself is a very small chunk when you look in the big picture. So, uh, so that in and of itself, there is a financial initiative or incentive here to, uh, to certainly receive that contract as well, to bid for that contract for a company, it doesn't matter who it is, to keep it. I was listening to Dan and uh, certainly uh, Dan is saying what our corporations are saying to the government as well. And it's, it's the protection of the intellectual property. Uh, uh, Definitely, you spent billions and billions of dollars doing that, and you really don't like to share it too much. Uh, but if you add to that as well, is that it, it, it's not only, okay, we'll give you some of the intellectual property. Some of it is given on, on, on the lower side, but on the higher side, the brain of the system, it'll be kept by, uh, Canada doesn't have necessarily the ability to, uh, to take on this kind of task. They're just not equipped with it. Uh, the, uh, you know, we, we do not buy airplanes or ships with a Commodore 64 as a brain uh, as a system in there. It's so sophisticated uh, that it's difficult for a Canadian company to take it. There's another point as well is the protection of that IP. If you give it to someone, because, and I'm talking about here of uh, countries who have interest in learning more about certain bits of equipment, uh, and uh, the easiest way for them to, to get to the system is not necessarily going against the, uh, the OEM themselves, but to go through the, the in-service support provider to get chunks of it. And if you build enough of that, so the security of it is becoming more and more important. And that's a significant investment for any, uh, any companies 
uh, I spoke to a lot of uh, SMEs who wanted part of it. And, uh, and when we talk about the security requirement to keep that technology uh, uh, safeguarded, uh, they do not realize the kind of cost in uh, the cost that would be uh, added to that. Uh, I can assure you that uh, I, I, very few companies will take for granted that they have an edge because they have a certain, uh, and it's based on, on uh, customer satisfaction. If, the, if you've managed to get ADM Matt or the customer uh, frustrated in the way the system is going, they may well be looking at a better solution. Likewise, if they're very happy with the system, uh, and, and uh, a good relationship, because all, it's all, a lot of it is relationship as well, they will look at it slightly differently because the, the, uh, the linkage is, is done already, the relationships exist and, and it's working. Additionally, some of the equipment uh, that is supported and maintained, uh, uh, whether it's vehicle, it doesn't matter whether airplane, vehicle or ship, uh, may be part of a global system, uh, I, meaning that the lessons learned from uh, Australia on the, the widget that they're operating are shared with all of the others, but that information is, is shared at the OEM level for protection of it, uh, for protection of, of the information, because Australia may not want to know, uh, may not want UK to know what they're going on, but a, a corporation can then turn around and turn it into, okay, we have a problem, that's how we fixed it. And, and you do work. So you, you, you really have a global solution to potential problems. And that's a plus uh, when, when you look at it. So uh, obviously uh, not winning is, is uh, you, don't, you don't do the stuff to lose. So uh, winning is important. There's a lot of pressure from the company. All of the, uh, all of the folks that I, I'm seeing here, uh, all of them, that corporation is putting a lot of pressure for a win. Uh, and, and it's an important point. If you don't, your stocks is not going to do well. And at the end of the day, it's stock value as well. I mean, uh, I, I'll say it again, Canada is not a large market, but Canada in, inside a global system has, has an interesting capability. And sometimes that's what I, uh, my, my frustration is, is uh, and I've seen this uh, in, in uh, some of the system is that we're trying to, they're trying to buy, uh, a piece of equipment, not into a system of system, a weapon system that has no global reach uh, because it's not only one country operating it, it goes across the board. So uh, when it comes time to renew uh, the contract and I've gone through one myself uh, or, or not myself, but I've seen the work on it, I can assure you uh, nothing is taken for granted because the stakes are too high. Uh, having said that, uh, there is, uh, issue of information, of sharing, of safeguarding the data and uh, to do that. Obviously, some of the stuff has been built in anyway with the uh, ITBs, uh, you know, to, we'll give you, uh, you know, we'll give you some of the work uh, if you buy our product. Uh, but then it gets even more complicated when you have ITBs that are not direct, but rather indirect, and that will give you more of the work you're doing on a commercial bit of equipment so again, it's, it's that balancing act that has to take a look at all of the system and all of it, but uh, the OEMs themselves may not be the best anyway at doing any sort of support, but they do it as a team and they'll keep the key elements and then try to share it as much as they can, mindful of this global mindset and need for security that one has to have. Uh, the interesting part is I asked once a member of the Canadian uh, government team I said, what's your biggest concern when you look at these contracts, whether it's an ISS, whether it's, a, 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 whether it's an acquisition? And I found it interesting because it was not the best equipment possible, the best cost, the best capability. It was my biggest fear is uh, litigation. We're going to end up in court over that. And I, while I appreciate it's painful, and I'm sure that the Marcia will, will uh, you know, he keeps a lot of people like Marcia in business. Uh, it's, is it really what? One, what defense is looking at, or they should be focusing on, on uh, the people at the pointy end, which uh, I, I've spent some time out there. And uh, I certainly would, would, uh, would like to explain to the parents of our, uh, our soldiers and uh, airmen, airwomen, and sailors uh, that uh, 
you you're, you didn't get a piece of equipment because we were afraid to get sued. We gave you a piece of equipment because we thought it was the best thing for you to do your job. So that's a, a good segue, I think, in a way at least, to, to come back to, back to you, Marcia, um, about the contract structures that we put in place. Uh, so both, both Charlie and I think Dan, maybe to a little bit more, uh, we're talking about some of the some of the uh, impediments to switching from an incumbent to somebody else, um, access to intellectual property, um, not being, I think probably being one of the most significant. So when it comes to the way that we structure contracts, it seems, I guess, as an observation, as a non-lawyer looking at these, there's a lot of impediments to making a change. Um, at the same time, the government and of Canada seems to go to a fairly significant effort to at least uh, leave open the possibility that change can occur in the future. But and again, reflecting on the last kind of 10 or 15 years, you don't actually tend to see all that much of it um, happen in reality. Um, does that mean that in terms of the way that these things are structured, uh, is there a misalignment between um, the way that we're, we're setting out the provisions? Um, or, or am I kind of missing the point and it's just what you need is to have a contract that allows for the possibility of, of going to somebody else and that keeps the kind of pressure uh, on companies and the right kind of incentives on that behalf of the government of Canada um, to achieve the kind of behavior that we're looking for. Sure. And I'll say my answer, depending on whether my client's the incumbent or not, will, of course, flip because that's what, you know, as a lawyer, I need to do. But I think part of the issue that we fundamentally are touching on is in the procurement process, I think there's greater attention to detail in the preparation, the communication, the collaboration and the execution. And, and what was pointed out, I can't remember if it was Charlie or Dan that pointed it out, is getting in at the ground at the start and prior to the procurement process when the government is engaging with industry and looking for feedback into their requirements development that's an incredibly crucial time and it's what we're always encouraging our clients to do because when you get to the end and you've lost the bid now all you've got left to do is complain um, you know, getting a, a contract overturned, it does not happen that often. You're going to have to really motivate either the court to see it that way or the CITT, or if you haven't taken either of those avenues and you're just trying a straight up government relations push, it's likely not going to happen. Um, but as far as is, is there a misalignment, I think the value of doing the asset acquisition with the in-service support is exactly as it's been explained, which is for the, the supplier, you don't make your money necessarily on the first sale. And that's not just in defense. That applies all the time to all my IT clients as well. Granting them the license to your technology isn't necessarily the win. It's the ongoing relationship and how you recover the cost of the underlying development that you've spent time, effort, and money and resources on, and how you contain, maintain that long-term in-service support relationship with the customer. Um, part, of, part of what you see in the contracting process, and there's a theory, an underlying theory to it, is that you know, the initial contract term will be for five years, and then there'll be all these periods of irrevocable options to renew that the contractor has to give to the government. Um, the theory of that is um, if you give a contractor too long of a contract, apparently there will become an element of contractor um, latency and, and uh, inattention to detail. If they, if they know they have 10 years, then are they going to continue to perform? The theory of the irrevocable options to renew process is that the contractor then is motivated because every year or every two years, their, contractor, their contract could be terminated. Unfortunately for my, you know, and I spent a decade doing defense procurement, I didn't necessarily see those you know, on the deals that I worked on and on the major crown procurements that I advised to. I didn't really see the irrevocable option theory come to fruition in that a contractor was motivated to continue to perform on the fear that their contract would be terminated. Because once you've gone through, as everybody here knows, a multi-million dollar procurement process that has taken you five years to get launched, you've gone through a year and a half of evaluation up to contract award. You know, and that's just a short term, that's six and a half years. Some procurements have, as we all know, gone longer. To, to think that realistically, once you've started to buy a major crown asset, that after five years, you might, you know, terminate and go out and redo the procurement is, is kind of what I almost sometimes view as a fool's errand, because you have so much invested, 
your provider is invested. There's technology that your provider owns that you have not necessarily got a full up license to or ownership of. And so, you know, to, to kind of think that that's the way to, to align this interoperability between the incumbent and the government, I don't think it necessarily um, proves true in that regard. Dan, I'll let you jump in on that. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Just very quickly to pile on to what member uh, Marcia said, the reason we picked short periods of initial contract duration was industry said to us, we can't predict a reasonable price beyond five to seven years. We will put our, our uncertainty risk into the price, whether that's a la labor effort or a, a, a level of effort or a firm fixed price. The second thing now is we have evolved to rolling waves of extension. So, so you, you, instead of driving the company up to that, that cliff of the five years and dropping dead, we say in the first two years, you'll win the sixth year and the, and the next year you'll win the seventh year and win the, win the, the eighth year in performance-based logistics and basis of payment that's much more flexible. And CFOs and companies are super happy with that because predictability of revenue is a huge deal. And avoiding this cliff that's looming that we might lose the, the big five-year extension. 